Well, good morning, Cornerstone family. I'm so glad that you're joining us online. I'm excited. We're only three weeks away from Easter, and I want to encourage you to uh, come on campus, be part of the worship celebration on Easter weekend. We have something going on Saturday for our kids and Sunday for everybody, the whole family. So I want to encourage you to be here at 11 o'clock. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And if you're not able to be on campus, do a viewing party at your house. You can invite somebody over or you can have them join you together and just celebrate Easter with us. Well, today we're going to talk about suffering. Peter talks about that there is suffering that we're going to go through in our lives. And, And I just want to mention there's really three kinds of sufferings. First, there's the common suffering. We, we all have physical aches and pains. Some of us can even predict the weather, right? We, we know when it's going to rain. Our joints are just telling us. Um, we have, you know, everyday hardships. You know, you have car issues. Your battery goes dead or you need a, a spare tire. Those are just your common suffering that we all go through. And there's also the self-inflicted suffering. Now, I, I've been kind of the king of that in the last couple of years. So uh, there are things that, you know, you don't put the pins in the tuna tower, you might go down hard. So I did, you know. Uh, if you're driving fast, you might get a speeding ticket, right? That's, that's, that's self-induced, right? Um, or maybe, maybe you don't study for a test and you didn't do your homework and everything. Well, then you're probably gonna do poorly on the test. Well, that's self-inflicted. We can't we can't blame other people on that, but that is a suffering we go through. Um, and then there's suffering for following Jesus, and that's what we're gonna really talk about today. That when we follow the Lord, if we choose to live our lives in a way to honor God, there's going to be suffering that comes along with it. Jesus warned us about this. He said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Uh, You know that if we we proclaim that Jesus is our Savior, our Lord, if we uh, proclaim that we need to turn our hearts over to him and walk with him, uh, there's going to be suffering that's going to be involved in that. And we need to be okay with that because God will bless us in this. Um, it was interesting this week I saw on Facebook uh, the difference uh, between um, uh, Steph Curry and Tim Tebow. They're both uh, great athletes, fantastic athletes, one uh, NFL star, one NBA star, and they both proudly proclaim their faith in Christ, which is a very good thing. Uh, but with Steph Curry, he's more widely accepted than Tim Tebow. And what is the difference? And the difference is they, they're both generous with their money, right? They give uh, to charities and they care about people. Uh, they both proclaim uh, God is good and God is faithful. But the difference with Tim, where he's not as accepted, is Tim speaks out on the truth of God's word on some issues. Uh, like we, we believe. I mean, we believe that um, every baby is precious in God's eyes, and, and we believe in life. And, and so uh, he, he will get some hate mail from that. He also talks about the issue of sex trafficking in the world and that we need to do something about it. And I'm glad that we are one of those many, many churches that we do something about it. Uh, we put our money where, you know, where it counts, and we help uh, women to be rescued from that. And we care about that. And we also believe that, you know, the porn industry, uh, that needs to be shut down. And, and anybody that supports that by viewing that, you're wrong. And, and this is hurtful uh, to uh, humans. And so we need to end this. So when you stand up for truth, uh, there's going to be a group of people that love darkness and they're going to attack you. But again, Peter says we need to be okay with that. So our Christian faith, we believe that God's word is God's word. We do not have the right to edit his word, but we are to obey it and follow it. So our big idea as we've been studying God's word in First Peter is this. Jesus is our living hope who sustains us through the trials of life. Jesus is alive. He's our hope. 
And, and because he has died for our sins and rose again on the third day, Easter Sunday, um, this, this is why we choose to follow him and this is why we have hope. This life is not all there is. So how do we deal with uh, our faith when it's being put under fire, when it's being tested, when we're going through trials? How do we overcome? Uh, Peter gives us three very good uh, options here. One, to expect it. We need to realize it's going to happen. People are not going to like the truth about God's word. They're not going to like the truth about God's love and mercy that is in Christ. And so people will rebel against it. So he says in verse 12, this is 1 Peter 4.12, he says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Now he's specifically talking about being persecuted for your faith in Christ. He says, but rejoice that you're per participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So don't be surprised. It, it's going to happen. Rejoice in the truth that God is with you. He's for you, and, and he will be with you during this difficult time. Uh, suffering will cause us to grow. Suffering will cause us to grow in our faith and in our maturity. Uh, verse 14, he says, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God's rest on you. So God is with you during, you know, as we, we share our faith in Christ, there'll be some, they'll be excited. They're, they're eager to hear. I, I believe right now there is a, a larger hunger than there has been in many decades. So, Right now, if there's any time to share our faith where there is more reception to that, it's now. It really is. People want to hear about hope. And people also, they're ready to know that there needs to be change. They're ready for change. I think they are. And, and so uh, speak boldly about God's love and mercy in Christ. In Romans 5, Paul talked about this. And he went through all kinds of persecution from being flogged to being imprisoned. Uh, for his faith, he says this, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So now, so, but we also rejoice in our suffering, because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character produces hope. So there's this progress, there's this growth going on in our spiritual walk. He says, hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So expect difficulties, expect that there will be some suffering that comes along proclaiming the name of Christ. Uh, be open to what God has for you. It, it, it's going to cause you to grow. It's not, it ultimately isn't going to harm you and hurt you in your walk with God. It's going to cause you to grow in your walk with the Lord. And I believe right now there's a harvest, a harvest of people that are just eager. They're, they're waiting to hear this good news about Jesus Christ rising from the dead, this good news that there is mercy in God that if we'll turn from our sins and turn to Jesus, we can find his mercy and experience his presence in our life. So expect there will be difficulties. There will be uh, trials in your life. And then the second thing he says is to evaluate it. We need to really evaluate why we're going through suffering. Are we going through suffering because we're self-induced here? You know, <laughs> we're causing it ourselves, or is it really because we're following the Lord? Um, if you're just sharing Jesus, but you're sharing him in a way that's rude and obnoxious, yeah, that's, that's not really honoring to the Lord. Uh, evaluate, evaluate why you're going through the suffering. Look what he says in verse 15. It says, if you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, prying to other people's affairs, right? I, that just makes sense, you know, so... Uh, I'm being nosy, I'm gossiping or whatever, and, and then all of a sudden people are mad at me. So I feel like, oh, I'm suffering for Jesus. No, you're not. <laughs> you're being very rude, you know? 
Or I, I'm suffering for Jesus because I told all my coworkers about Jesus you know, on work and I don't understand why everyone's mad at me. Well, maybe it's because you did it during work hours where you should be doing your job. <laughs> so uh, examine, why are you suffering? If it's for the Lord and you're doing the right thing and you're doing, being respectful, then God's going to bless you in this. But if you're just being rude and obnoxious or you're stealing and making trouble, hmm, that, examine yourself there. Evaluate it. He says, there's no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. I mean, if, if you're suffering for the Lord and you're doing the right thing, and you're being kind, and you're being generous, and you're doing your job when you're supposed to be doing your job, I think people are more open to that. I think people will be listening to that. I think people right now, again, are eager to hear about God's mercy. He says, for the time has come for judgment, and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? Hmm. And also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? Just think about what it took to save us. It took Jesus, holy, perfect Jesus, to live a perfect life, to offer his perfect life as a sacrifice to pay for our sins. He atoned for our sins. It, he was the ransom for our sins. If we're barely saved, that's the only way I'm saved. I don't know about you. It's the only way that you're saved is by what he did for us. For those who reject him, for those who say, I don't want any part of God's one and only son, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming and it begins with us. God will examine our lives. And, and if we're being rude, then shame on us. If we are not giving 100% at work and doing our jobs, then shame on us. But if we are honoring God, if we are honoring our work and our responsibilities at home and in our neighborhoods and in our church and at work, if we're doing the right thing, God will bless us in this. He says, uh, judgment begins here. And, and I think that should be a sobering thing. We should always look at our lives and say, okay, am I doing the right thing right now? Uh, there's this law of the harvest that as you put in what is right, what is good, what is fair, what is honest, what is equitable, you're, you're doing the right, fair, just thing you'll receive that coming back. It's the law of the harvest. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul talks about this. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So if you're sowing seeds of dishonesty, well, you're going to get that back. But if you're being honoring, you're being good, you're doing the right things, You'll get that back. It says, the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. This all makes sense. Let's not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. Keep doing what is right. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all people. I'll say that one more time. Do good to all people. Let's be responsible, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We have a responsibility to care for one another, to love on one another, and, and that is a testimony we have to our community. When they walk through our doors or they see us on the pickleball court or they, they see us in the children's ministry or in the youth ministry or in the cafe, and they see the fellowship we have, that we care about one another, that we're generous and we're giving and we're honoring and respectful of one another. As they look at the way we deal with our finances during the week and at work and at home, and, and as they see that we take care of the duties we have at work, that we have integrity, 
That's a testimony. And there's blessings that come back as we do the right thing. So let's believe in the law of the harvest. Let's do the right thing. Let us evaluate how we are living our lives. And if we're being persecuted, for doing the right thing, God's got us. So expect it, evaluate it. And then the third thing he says is to entrust our life to God. Trust that God has got our back. God is with us. God knows what's going on. He's not surprised. It's like, I can't believe that guy is being persecuted for me. You know, it's like, God knows. And even in the worst situations, God still can bring good out of it. I, I think of the Apostle Paul and, and Peter, I, many of the disciples that follow God, that serve God, um, help plant churches, they were persecuted. They were arrested. They were thrown in jail. They had terrible things done to them. And yet through all of that, the church grew. And God's word got out to more people. It didn't stay just in Jerusalem where the resurrection happened. It went throughout Asia, went out through the whole world. So Peter says this, 1 Peter 4, 9, he says, so if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, you've examined yourself, you, you evaluate it, right? If you suffer in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. And trust your lives to God. If you're doing the right thing, you've examined it, you're, you're not being rude. <laughs> you're doing the right thing. God's got you. He's with you. Verse First uh, Peter one three has been our remember verse. He says, "Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He's given us a new birth into a living hope uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's with us. Our hope is living. Jesus has proven that death is nothing to fear, because there is life after this world. So even if the worst." like what happened to Peter and what happened to Paul, that they lost their lives because of preaching the gospel, the gospel reached more people. The good news of Christ went out and the whole world now has heard about God's love and mercy. One of the confidence that we have is our living hope that Christ rose from the grave. I thought I would end this message with just the promise of hope in Romans 8. It's a familiar passage. It's one of my favorite passages. And, and I know that you've been there with your own physical aches and pains and normal suffering that we all go through because these bodies don't last forever. I know it looks like it will, but no, it doesn't. And all of us maybe have experienced being um, put down, people being mad at us because we follow Jesus. It happens. But take joy in this, that God is with you. He is with us. And so in Romans 8, 28, Paul so eloquently says, he says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So in all things, I mean, your, your physical aches and pains, some of the finances that have Got blown apart, literally. I and mean, just in the last couple of weeks, there's been crazy stuff in the banks. Uh, many of us have experienced the 2007, 2008, you know, bubble pop and all that. And God's still with us. God's name is still being heard. The mercy of Christ is going out to more people. This life is not all that there is. God works through all of this. He works through the problems that we've gone through, all things, if you love him. If you love him, then you're called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And I just want to point out that as God is working all things together for his good, his purpose through our trials is what he, he just said in verse 29, 
to conform us to the image of Jesus. A lot of that happens through trials. A lot of that happens through discomfort. A lot of that happens through our problems and, and our bodies not working the same way that they used to work or um, being persecuted, people being mad at you because you follow Christ. God is going to cause you to grow in faith and to be more and more like Jesus, to be more full of mercy and grace. Verse 30 says, And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And, and I just want to connect the predestination, and the glorification, and the justification. All of this is for one purpose. To affirm you. To encourage you in your faith. That God loves you. He knows you from the very beginning. He didn't choose you because you're that good. <laughs> you're not. He chose you because he loves you and because he wants you to be like his son. And he made the only way possible through his son dying on the cross for your sins. Verse 31, Paul says, so what then shall we say in response to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Seriously, who can be against us? I mean, today, a, a, a drunk driver could take my life. Would that change any of God's love for me? Not at all. I'm praying it doesn't happen. I hope you're praying it doesn't happen. But that wouldn't stop God's love from me. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? God loves us. He is for us. He is with us. That's what Peter was saying. That's what Paul is saying. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And I don't think I like any of those right there. Do you? But none of those would separate us from God's love. I don't want to make light. I know some of us right now, you're going through some terrible news from the doctor, some terrible physical issues some financial issues, some relational issues. It's hard to see your way through the gray and murky waters, but God is with you. He is for you. And none of this that is going on right now changes God's love for you. He says, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And if you... Think about the first century believers. This was so true. It seemed like the world turned against them. Knowing all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. I love that. I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels or demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height or depth, or in or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing that you're going through right now can separate you from God's love. Nothing in your life is saying God doesn't love you. I know we think that at times. Sometimes we think, God, do you not love me anymore? Do you not like me anymore? God, are you mad at me? None of those questions are true. God loves us. He is for us. And we will suffer persecution. We will suffer hardship in this world. Why? One, this world's a broken and fallen world. It's messed up. And two, we're messed up. <laughs> we're not all there. I, I haven't arrived. You haven't arrived. So we're going to go through hardship. These bodies are not meant to last. They won't last. But God is with us. He is for us. Trust. Trust the Lord. Entrust your life to the Lord. And trust, when we trust him, it overcomes fear. When we trust him, it overcomes depression. When we trust him, it overcomes hate. 
Are you trusting God enough to stand for your faith today? Will you join me as I invite my friends, my neighbors? Will you invite your friends, your neighbors, your family members to join us either online or in person here on campus? The weekend of Easter this year is going to be off the hook amazing. 11 o'clock on Saturday and 11 o'clock on Sunday. Both days, power packed, so much fun, so much celebration, free food, free all kinds of stuff. You want to be here for this. But also, you want to invite your friends to this. Will you trust God enough to stand up for your faith and invite someone to come join us celebrate? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are with us, that there is nothing, as Paul has mentioned, he's like, I try to think of everything. There's, there's nothing out there that can separate us from God's love. Not demons, not angels, not persecution, not hunger, famine, not heartaches, not banks collapsing, God, you are with us and you are for us. Lord, help us to see the temporal just right now. Open our minds, open our eyes to see how temporary banks and houses and sickness and pain, all that is. It's just temporary. And open our minds to understand what is eternal, our relationship with you. And you've made us, your sons, your daughters, through what Christ Jesus has done on the cross. Lord, help us get the word out. Help us to invite people to come to celebrate this amazing hope that we have in you. It is in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you made a decision today, please let me know. I'd love to encourage you to help you walk closer with the Lord. If you'd like to be baptized, please let me know. You can just text me at 858-682-2424 and just say baptized. I'm, I'm interested in being baptized. And we'll love to set up a time to celebrate with you. Until next week, God bless. God bless.